welcome to The Practical Prophetic, where prophetic ministry is made practical. I'm Beth Wingate, I'm your host, and welcome to the podcast. On our podcast today, we are going to talk about biblical definitions for praise and worship. Now, you may be asking, is praise and worship or is music prophetic? Well, that is an entire series to be able to answer that question and be able to back that up with with Bible study. So I want to dig into these definitions. Now, I want to talk about this for a minute. So I've been involved in music ministry for many years, and I believe just from my own experience that what happens on the stage with the worship team a lot of times sets the culture, and it's also a microcosm of the entire church. And so the value or the importance of worship cannot be understated in the church. It is central to what happens when we come together as a body to worship the Lord. Well, let me dig into these definitions. And I also want to say that this is really what started me on my journey uh, in deeper Bible study and in really falling in love with Hebrew word studies and really beginning to grasp a deeper layer of understanding in the Bible. So many years ago, I had expressed an interest in learning to wanting to learn to play the guitar. And my husband surprised me with a guitar as a gift. And it started me on a journey to learn about music. And I was already into my 20s. And so I was a late bloomer. And as I began to play and uh, for, you know, a Bible study or whatever, a complete novice, I began to ask questions in prayer about the value and wanting a deeper understanding of music and how it connected to the Lord. And so I, uh, back in that day, Blue Letter Bible was brand new on the internet. This would have been in the very late 90s. And I had still my big red Strong's Concordance. The Blue Letter Bible Concordance wasn't really part of Blue Letter very much at that point. And my highlighter, and oftentimes a yellow legal pad, and I began to do studies on uh, wanting to answer that same question, is uh, music prophetic? And uh, I wanted to know about women and music in the Bible, and I wanted to know what was the purpose of music, and Uh, You know, just so many questions. You know, I want to stop and sidebar and say this, that when you really get connected to the Word of God, and remember, in 1 John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus and the Word are one and the same. We must have that foundational revelation that Jesus is the Word. And so when we begin to study His Word and dig deep into His Word, like mining out treasure, under the earth. When you begin to dig, uh, you learn a new facet of who Jesus is. And it's a journey. It's like walking into the Biltmore. You have this vast mansion and you walk into the, to the foyer, to the first room, and you're often presented with doors and passageways that lead to more rooms, and those rooms contain doors and passageways, and many of the rooms interconnect. And so that's the way I see the Word of God. It's a vast mansion with a secret door. You know, there's closets, there's bathrooms, there's kitchens. You know, there's so much that this house offers, and it's a journey. And so you've got to fall in love with the journey, the excitement of learning everything you can that you need to mine out in God's Word. And for me, that area has really been concentrated largely on music, which has sent me on on an exploration of the entire house. And I'm, I feel like I've only hit a couple of rooms, and there's so much uh, you know, more to go and, and the journey and, and the excitement is in the journey itself. And so I want to share some of these with you. And I'm and hopefully this will lead to several episodes where we, we um, spotlight and highlight different things about music and answer the question for you, is music prophetic? And I can definitely answer that question, but I want to build a foundation I want to build a foundation before we do that. So first, let me explain about Hebrew. And I've done this in a couple of episodes. And so I hope this is not redundant. But when you hear things over and over, then you really, they begin to sink in. English and Hebrew are different. In the King James and English, we may have the word praise or we may have the word worship. 
But in Hebrew, that can lead to a dozen definitions for that word. Their language is much more vast and broad. They don't use adjectives in the same way that we do. So when a word is used, it really goes into deeper description in the nuance of the way the word is spelled in Hebrew. And like I said, they have word wheels. They have root words, which are like the hub of the wheel, and then expanded definitions, which are like the spokes on the wheel. A wheel can roll without a couple of spokes, but it cannot roll without that hub. You must have that root word, that foundational understanding of what a word is trying to communicate. So let's dig into these definitions. Let's gain a deeper understanding of what the Bible means when it talks about praise and worship. Because when I dug into this, it was life-changing for me. This uh, opened a whole new level of understanding about music for me. So uh, let's start with some of these. And these are all taken out of the Strong's Concordance or the Thayer's Concordance. And so I want to dig into these definitions. So the word praise in your King James Bible has uh, over a dozen translations or definitions in both the Hebrew and the Greek. So I want to move through these. If you'll just bear with me, I think you'll get a lot out of this. So the first one is, uh, I'm going to give you the Strong's number. I'm going to attempt to say the word in Hebrew, and then we're going to really concentrate on these different definitions. So the first one is Strong's H1288. It is the word Barak, and that word means to kneel, to bless, to thank, or is an act of adoration. So that can be expressed oftentimes in worship services, and in, in especially where there's music. So you may see someone really uh, be moved by this expression of worship, and they may put their hand, you know, to their heart or close their eyes. You know, some people may cry. Some people may kneel reverently. Just this heart of gratitude. There is a Hebrew word that describes that type of praise, and that word is barak. And so that's one example. But, oh, this word praise is vast. So we're going to dig deep into all these definitions. Uh, the next one is Strong's H1974, and it is Hill Lul. Now, this word is a celebration of Thanksgiving, and it actually goes really deep because this one is also connected to Rosh Hashanah and the fall feast days. And so it also then would have connected to that the idea of Teshuvah in Hebrew. And Teshuvah is basically a season of taking inventory in your life and then having an ad, a repentant attitude, an attitude of returning to God, of turning oneself away from sin. And so this is a, I guess you could say, a reflective type of thanksgiving and one where you make a renewed commitment to the Lord. This is just for the word praise. We've already dove in, you know, we've already taken a deep dive on two different forms of praise here. You know, one is to kneel out of thanksgiving and this other one is connected to the idea of renewal and repentance and returning inside that thanksgiving and so uh, let's dig deeper let's keep going because we've got a lot of ground to cover just in this short podcast uh, the next one is halal now halal is where we get the word hallelujah it's connected to that word and it's the word for praise and this one is very interesting in the Hebrew, and this will make our Pentecostal and charismatic brothers and sisters happy, this one means to uh, boast, to rave, to make a show, to act clamorously foolish like a madman. So if you want to know if, you know, emotional uh, expressions of worship and praise in, in maybe a charismatic or Pentecostal church, is that considered authentic praise? Well, I believe by this definition, we just answered that question. Yes, this is a valid expression of praise based on just the word halal in the Hebrew. It also means to shine. And so I would describe this as exuberant praise. Uh, this definition embodies that entire idea. And so, uh, you know, some people bristle because uh, at the idea, they think it's irreverent to uh, act, you know, 
wild in worship, so to speak. Now, I do think we have to do things in order. Apostle Paul talks about that. There's a time and a place for everything. and But this is absolutely a valid expression of worship. In fact, David, we know he danced before the Lord with the ark, and uh, it caused a ruckus. And so um, traditional people have a hard time with this expression of praise, and we won't make a big debate about it. I've, I've, I've qualified it that there's absolutely a time and a place for this type of worship, but it is acceptable worship to the Lord, and it is a valid form of praise based on Strong's H-1984, Halal. That's what that word means. Let's keep moving. Let's keep plowing. I really believe this can be a revelation for some people as they move forward and they get some freedom to worship the Lord in one of these expressions and that you can know with confidence that uh, your worship is acceptable to the Lord. Uh, The next one is one that I love so much. This is the Hebrew uh, word H3034, and it is Yada or Yada. It means to throw up your hands, extend your hands, to confess and to praise. It can even mean to like to to bemoan or wring your hands. That so there's a there's a couple of ways we could describe this in our modern worship services. So extending one's hands in worship, obviously, uh, that has become more accepted in, in the last decade. But it is the the sign of surrender that you're surrendering to the Lord, and it's an acceptable form of worship based on these Hebrew word studies. It means to to extend your hands. It means to confess, to praise, to yada. Uh, it can also mean supplication. It says to, to bemoan or wring your hands. It, you know, when you are stressed, when you are going through something, when something is bugging you, Take it to the Lord and you can be expressive. This is the time and the place for your emotion. You know, Lord, it's not fair. Lord, this person hurt me. Lord, I'm struggling with this. Lord, I don't understand. And this is this is a form of worship. And Lord, I and then you start reminding the Lord of his own word. Uh, not that he forgot, but that we need to <laughs> we need to confess that. And so I always say Jesus answered with it is written. And that's how we should answer. Lord, you said in your word that you would do this or that, you know, and Lord, that I'm trusting in you. Lord, my my flesh is weak, but my spirit is willing, you know, and this is how we should be praying. And this is an acceptable form of worship to lift your hands. And that really just means surrendering to the Lord. So I hope there's no debate with anyone over that form of worship. But you have a Hebrew word here for the word praise that tells you this is what the Lord means. And, and I, I can go back through and give us examples of these in scriptures, but this would be a four series podcast if I did that. So I just wanted to keep this kind of brief and, and I would encourage you to look these up on your own. And this is, of course, one of my favorites. Uh, Strong's H two one six seven Zamar or Zalmar, and it means to strike with the fingers, to make music, to celebrate in song, or to play instruments skillfully. So this covers music in the church. This is an acceptable form of praise to have music. Now we can debate over style. We can debate over, you know, instruments and volume and all of those things. And there are some churches that don't believe in having musical instruments in the church. But however, it is an acceptable form of worship to have music in the church. And I am a firm believer in the power of music and worship and praise and worship. And I'm, I'm committed to that cause. And so I hope this sets somebody free today <laughs> that, that you can absolutely worship the Lord in music. You know, I believe that it's all about the attitude of our heart. So let's keep going because we have a lot of definitions just for the word praise in your Bible. The next one is Strong's H4110. And it is Mahalal, uh, which is also connected to that word hallelujah. Hallelujah is connected to many of these words, uh, halal being the root word. Uh, and that's the one where you dance like David did a little wild. And so uh, Mahalal means fame, praise, and boast. And so when we're, you know, maybe you're in a worship service and someone just is like, Jesus, you know, 
that would maybe describe this Hebrew word. I believe that's an expression. You know, when we clap in church and we clap for the Lord, that describes Mahalal. And so these are expressive forms of worship that the Hebrew really gets specific about where the English just sort of glosses over everything with this blanket phrase of praise. (laughs) It's like uh, here in the South, we say Coke, but by Coke, we may mean Sprite. We may mean Dr. Pepper. We may mean Sunkissed. We just sort of make this blanket statement of Coca-Cola when we actually mean a lot of different specific things. Same thing here. We may say the word praise, but actually, when you dig into the Hebrew, we mean a lot of different things, but they're all praise. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, Strong's H5568 is Salmar. Oh, and I love this one. (laughs) This one means, uh, and it's connected also to Zalmar, which is the wild one. Uh, It means to stand up. Woo! Have you ever been in church and the pastor's preaching and you get very moved and something he says bears witness with your spirit? You have that rhema revelation. Rhema is the Greek word that means a quickened word where the Holy Spirit breathes life into the Word of God, and it bears witness with your soul. And you may have a physical reaction. You ever heard a word from the Lord, and man, it just shoots through you, and it kind of jars you a little bit, and you're like, whoa, that hit my spirit. That's what this word is describing. It means to stand up. Uh, You can be in church, and the pastor can be preaching, and something will hit you, and you'll just stand up in agreement because it bears witness with your spirit. It also says the other definition here means to tremble. Oh, I've been here before when the Lord just speaks to you and it's so powerful. You're just like, oh, you'll get the goosebumps and you'll be just electric almost with the revelation and the power of God's word. Look, we serve a living God and his word is alive and it speaks life to us. That is the very essence of rhema. And so I hope you, if you've never had that experience, oh, I pray that the Lord gives you that kind of experience. But you know what? You got to get in his word. You have to read his word. There's an old joke that my father-in-law used to tell that's really silly. He And I'll sidebar to make this point. He told this joke about this lady that every day she went and prayed that God would let her win the lottery. (laughs) And so she prayed every day and every day. And after 10 years, she got mad and said, God, I don't understand. I've prayed to win the lottery for 10 years and I've never won the lottery. I don't understand God. And then all of a sudden the clouds parted, a ray of light shot down on her. And this booming, thundering voice said, lady, at least buy a ticket. So, boom, boom, that's my joke. And so, but it makes this point. If you're not in his word, you won't be able to have those rhema experiences where the word of God is quickened in your spirit. Oh, we could do a whole program just on that. I better stop. All right, let's move to our next definition. This one is uh, H7623. And it's called Shabak. I jokingly call it Shambok because that's the name of a preacher uh, when I was a kid that was a Pentecostal word of faith preacher that was very popular. But it's Shabak, but I like to say Shambok. And this one means to soothe, to address in a loud tone, to comment, uh, to commend, or to boast. And so this is when people shout in church, <laughs> basically. Maybe, you know, you're like, amen. Now, of course, we should do things in order. There's a time and a place for everything. But if the pastor says, can I get an amen? This is your time to shambok in church or to, sh- <laughs> to shambok in church. Just I'm getting silly with it. So, uh, but it, it's it's a powerful form of praise acceptable to the Lord based on this word. The next one is Strong's H eight four one six, and we have talked about this in here already. But it is the word Tahila. Oh, and this word is so powerful. I'm just skimming over the surface. Every one of these words are a deep teaching when you cross-reference every time they're used in your Bible and you do a deep dive on each of these words. I mean, I should probably just write a book because this is 
uh, there's so much here to unpack. But Tehillah is connected to our dreams. It's connected to prophecy. And it means a song of praise or an act of general praise. And so the word Tehillah all by itself is very powerful. We have just skimmed the surface. I've just given you the introduction You don't even really know Tehillah yet until you dig in. But this word is so powerful all by itself. And so Tehillah is another expression of praise. You mean we can even praise God in our dreams? Is that what you're insinuating? Yes, ma'am. And yes, sir, I am. So let's keep going. Strong's H8426. This one is Toda. And it means an extension of the hands. A choir of worshipers, come on, that would cover your choirs and your worship teams. That's acceptable worship to the Lord. And it's a confession and thanksgiving. And so uh, this is a vast word. It covers a lot of things, but it definitely covers uh, the musicians or the choir sing, you know, the singers in the church. If you really dig into David and, and the temple, and he had a man named, Sh- uh, Sh- his name is like Shanina in the Bible, but I call it, you know, Shanina because of Shanina Twain. <laughs> but uh, that's my own little little things to help me remember things. And so he was a skilled uh, singer and he led the choir in the tabernacle for David. Oh, how powerful. And I believe when Solomon constructed the temple, it was Shanina or however you say his name. He's the one that led the choir. So a choir is absolutely an acceptable form of praise. And a worship band is just a small ensemble of singers. It's just in a modern format. So that is acceptable too. Let's keep going. We're going to switch now to the Greek. We have our Greek counterparts just for the word praise. Greek, much like Hebrew, you have lots of definitions that make up one English word. English is a little uh, more casual, not as formal, and not as specific in our language as these uh, Eastern languages. Okay, so the first one in Greek is a G134. And it is a henio, and it means uh, to honor God, to praise God, to exalt or to vow or to give a thank offering. And so this is a more reverential form of worship. Those churches where it's very uh, liturgical and, and reverent, that is absolutely also an acceptable praise to the Lord. There's, a, there's many ways to, to achieve the goal of praise and worship. And I believe if you allow the Holy Spirit, he will direct you in the right way at the right time to have maximum impact. Hallelujah. All right, let's keep moving. This one we're all familiar with. It's G1391, and it is the word doxa, where we get the doxology. And so it means glory. It means honor, and it means praise. And so this is when we give glory to God. Anytime you hear somebody say glory to God, you think of doxology or doxa in the Greek, and that's an acceptable word that is translated praise. All right, the next one, and these get into some of my favorites. It is a G1867. It's epihene. I believe that's correct, but it means to approve or to applaud. So clapping your hands is an acceptable form of praise and worship in the church. So however that comes, you know, some people will clap to the music in our modern worship services and some give an applause, you know, directed usually by the pastor to give, you know, give a, a give the Lord a hand clap of worship. That's acceptable form of worship based on this uh, epihenio. I believe that's how you said I've got a little pronunciation guide here. The next one is G1868 epihenos. And this one is interesting. It means a commendable thing. And I believe this is when we just tell the Lord all the things he's done for us. We commend him. You know, Lord, thank you for saving me. Oh, but for the grace of God go I. You know, and you just give the Lord that form of praise and worship. Oh, I love that. That's powerful. We need to be reminded and we need to, t- to acknowledge to the Lord of the things he's saved us from and brought us through and helped us to overcome. That's powerful. That's, that's encouragement at its highest level, which is a form of praise and worship. And it's described by this Greek word, epihenos. 
I love that. The next one is a, a G5214, and it is Humneo. Humneo, I believe I pronounced that right. And it means to give song or hymns in praise and worship. Oh, I love this. So when you turn on your favorite worship artist, you know, maybe it's, you know, Bethel or whoever, and you turn that on, you're 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 giving an acceptable form of praise and worship to the Lord through music, expressed through music. I love that. Uh, we've got a couple more. I want to keep going and plowing with this. The next one is G1479. I don't even know if I can say this word, but I love this one. It's a Ethel Auth Reiskia. I'm not sure if I'm saying that quite right. It's it's Greek to me, but uh, that's the word. And this one is interesting. This one's sort of a catch-all. It means voluntary, impulsive, self-prescribed worship and praise to the Lord. Wow. That's really vast and broad. So uh, let's break that down. So voluntary, of course, that means you you choose how to worship. It means impulsive. You didn't put a whole lot of premeditation and thought into it. You just went with the feeling <laughs> and self-prescribed, meaning you use your own, you know, within reason, within biblical standard, you can have a, a little bit of liberty here to uh, to be creative, to be self-prescribed. So uh, let's say someone decides to lay prostrate on the ground in a form of worship. Um, now, that would not be appropriate in the middle of preaching. But uh, let's say in a Bible study or a setting like that, or maybe you're alone with the Lord, that is acceptable. And it is covered by this Greek word. You are not uh, off the mark, so to speak. And so in the right setting, that's acceptable. And there's a, a word in the Bible under the definitions of praise and worship that describe that. So I hope this brings a little encouragement and liberty to you that there are many ways we can offer acceptable praise and worship to the Lord as we do a deep dive on the definitions for praise and worship. You know, it really comes down, like I said, to the attitude of the heart. Of course, we can't just be uh, in complete liberty because that's anarchy and chaos. There must be a degree of order, but uh, I don't. I think these give us a lot of liberty within within that boundary. And I want to talk about boundaries for one minute. Uh, there is a book that I highly recommend by Dr. Henry Cloud called Boundaries. Uh, it's I believe the subtitle is uh, When and How to Say No, <laughs> When to Say Yes, When to Say No, and then How to Say No. It's an excellent book. Uh, one of the things he talks about in that book is boundaries and how boundaries work in our life, and that boundaries are not for our restriction. Boundaries actually provide us with uh, liberty inside of those bounds. I, I know Dr. Jordan Peterson, the sociologist, I, I listen to him occasionally. Uh, he talked about, he, he's specialized in child psychology for many years, and he talked about how there were studies where they took a group of children and put them in a playground. And, and children were put into a playground with a fence, and then some were put into a playground with no fence. The children who did not have a fence would cluster in the very center of the playground and would not stray very far at all. But the children who had a fence would scatter throughout the playground right up to the fence. And so he talked about how that boundaries actually give us more liberty because we have clearly defined uh, you know, where we can go and where we cannot go. And that gives us confidence to know, oh, this is in the safe zone or, you know, the prescribed zone. And so I, I talk about here, too, that with my when my children were very young, we had a, a long driveway that slanted a little bit toward the street and they would like to ride their little you know vehicles down the driveway and we would draw with chalk a little start finish line. Well, I drew a line and told my children, yeah, do not go past this line. This is your hard boundary that to keep them from having a good time it was for their safety because cars wouldn't be able to you know to stop in time or they wouldn't be able to stop in time and that could be very dangerous and so that sort of maybe illustrates the point about boundaries but listen God has given us 
a lot of liberty here in worship. And so I hope you have uh, never been told not to lift your hands or not to clap because that is actually, that is not okay. That The scripture here describes that those are absolutely acceptable forms of worship. Now we do have boundaries and I, I really wanted to drive home that counterpoint that, you know, in the middle of preaching, it is not appropriate to yell, you know, <laughs> run, clap, unless it's, you know, been given liberty to do, to do that. Or, you know, during a, a funeral, that would not be acceptable or a wedding or, or you know, communion and things like that. We, we have protocol. But within that, we do have a lot of liberty. And so I hope you have a degree of freedom as we go through these. And, and I'm going to answer the question in the coming weeks after I've laid this foundation about music and the prophetic. And I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to those discussions. And I've talked to a few people I'd like to have on as guests to really do a deep dive on those topics. But I hope this will get us started as we have a deeper understanding of the biblical definitions for praise and worship in your Bible. I hope this blessed and encouraged you. I look forward to our future podcast about music. Have a blessed day. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Please be sure to hit the subscribe button so you'll be informed next time I post. Thank you again and have a blessed day.